This is the Blue White Tailgate Show, Penn State, Indiana, four game losing streak. We brought in a new guy, Andrew Callista. Hey Trey, thanks a lot, that means a lot. Really, that's how it's gonna be? I just got here. I bagged the tie this week because I knew there was nothing in my closet that could match Callista's. Blue White Tailgate's next. Steve Jones, Trey Bauer, Andrew Callista in Todd Sadowski's seat. Uh oh. All right. <laughs> this is the Blue White Tailgate presented by Coors Light. A tough one for Penn State, a hard loss to take. Oh, it's a terrible loss for Penn State to take, especially with how the game started. Maryland, they came in with a chip on their shoulder in the Beaver Stadium. Probably an inferiority complex that they brought in as well. And you know what? They backed it up, they went out with a win. All right. So. Let's get to Frankly Speaking, presented by the Blaze Alexander Family Dealerships. Mike Hull on the loss and bouncing back. Yeah, um, you know, it obviously hurts. You put so much into it, but, you know, it's over with. Uh, you can't focus on the past. Uh, you just got to keep playing and uh, put our head down and go to work. No question about that. Now, Trey, frustration, though, sets in. I mean, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but a defense that's actually played at a high level. The defense has played at a great level all year long. The fact is that they don't have any help on the offensive side right now. Um, the turnovers, the, the penalties, it's just they, they, can't, they can't do it all. They just need to focus on what they're doing. And it's two-thirds. Their offense isn't moving the ball well enough, 194 yards this time. I mean, they'll tell you that. And it's not to say special teams. The big fumble by Haley, huge, and the punting. Yeah, Bill O'Brien always used to talk about complementary football. Get offense from your defense, get your defense from your offense. And when you're struggling on the offense and you're constantly backed up in your own territory, and then the special teams, the punting game, letting you down, 24-yard punts, 34-yard punts, and fumbles on kick returns, that puts your defense back against the wall. And eventually, it's going gonna, it's gonna to break. It can't stay stout an entire football game like that week after week. Because we need a break from that shirt, we'll do that with upon further <laughs> review with our good friend, Fran Fisher. Is there anyone, pundit, fan, expert, man, woman, or child who hasn't made a comment about the Nittany Lions offensive line play this year? Is it about talent or is it about coaching? This is a slippery slope for me. I certainly want to show respect for the consistent effort made by our young guys. In response to those who prefer to take a crack at the coaching, I submit the following. In 2012 and 2013, this Penn State coaching staff and the teams they coached at Vanderbilt defeated Tennessee twice, Kentucky twice, Ole Miss, Florida, Georgia, Wake Forest twice, plus Houston and North Carolina State in bowl games. Uh, by the way, the Commodores are in the SEC, a reasonably tough conference. If you don't believe me, check with the ESPN. Here's a mind bender for you. Last season, Vanderbilt scored 34 rushing touchdowns behind an offensive line coached by Herb Hand, who came to Penn State with Coach Franklin. Through the Nittany Lions' first eight games this year, five rushing touchdowns have been scored. The latter numbers, of course, underscore that youth, inexperience, and the time needed to develop offensive linemen are significant parts of the difficulty. Okay, it's time to think bowl game. Not quite. For WHVL's Blue White Tailgate Show, this has been Upon Further Review. I'm Fran Fisher. Thank you, Fran. As always, talk about, okay, blame to go around, except I'm going to take a different tact here. In reality, you look at the last three games, five-point game, but again, three points essentially. They, they, it's a safety they had to take. Yep. Okay. End of tie regulation, then this one by one. In reality, they're four or five plays away from winning all that. Yes. I mean, th the point is, is that on any given football game, you're going to have one, two, three or plays that are going to determine the outcome of the game. And the fact is that Penn State for this year has not been able to capitalize on the opportunities where it's presented to them. Either they have to make a stop, they have to kick the ball better, they have to protect better, and they're just not getting it done. And Austin Johnson knows it's all been winnable. I just don't want to... Uh 
anybody like getting used to losing or the fans getting us used to uh, us losing. That's not what we're about. And I mean, it, it's always hunger to win. And that's a big point by number 99. Don't get used to that. They want to turn that around. That brings in leadership and that brings in Todd Sadowski. Consistency is really one of our, our main uh, flaws on offense, and when we're not consistent, obviously we're going to stall at some point in the drive. So if we just keep doing our job throughout the whole drive and not be complacent, then we'll be able to you know, string something together. This is an extremely young group of guys now reeling from four consecutive losses, but they've been through tough times before. It's up to the team leaders to keep this group together once again. Definitely going to be frustrated whenever you lose four games. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it, it hasn't been uh, the best four weeks, but, um, you know, you just got to put your head down and go to work um, and, you know, put everything behind you whenever, uh, whenever things happen like that. Me being the young guy last year to now me being the old guy still at 19 years old this year uh, has been a little bit of a transition, but, you know, you, you, it's what I signed up for. It's what we all signed up for, and it's what we have to deal with and we got to go out and win games. If you want leadership and consistency, look no farther than one of the least intimidating figures on the team, senior kicker Sam Ficken. Obviously, every kick you see goes in, uh, builds confidence in your ability, and multiple times, every time I'm, I'm called upon, I'm expected to do my job, and that's make the kick. You look how far he's come, you look at the confidence that he's playing with right now, the type of leader he's been for our team. I can't say it enough what a great example he is for all of us, including myself. Nothing against Sam. It would be nice to see him kicking a few more point after touchdowns instead of field goals. I'm Todd Sadowski for the Blue White Tailgate. Yeah, and the domino, by the way, of sanctions. If Anthony Fair is not allowed to transfer right away to Texas, Sam Ficken would have redshirted. He'd be the kicker next year. And one quick comment on Maryland. Under Armour, I guess, is in charge of their jerseys. Who's in charge of the helmets? Crayola? <laughs> we'll talk about the offense in a moment as we continue with Blue White Tailgate after this. I get no You know, it's interesting. We've talked about Penn State's offense. Uh, Maryland's numbers, by the way, offensively were worse, including one of 14 on third down. We'll get to that later. Sam Ficken is going to be our family clothesline player of the week. And what a fabulous game he had. Four for four in field goals, three of three beyond 40 yards in that win. Why Randy Etzel didn't take a holding penalty to bump him back 10 on one is a complete mystery to me. He is six of six this year beyond 40 yards. The only two he's missed this year weren't misses. They were blocked. There's the Rutgers and Northwestern, the only two. I know how much you love kickers. <laughs> I oh, like. I like. Oh I, come on! I, I like. I like Sam Ficken, and Sam Ficken has done a great job this year. He really has. He has three tackles on special teams. Huh? Okay, that's see that makes me happy. Okay, it's a, that makes that, me that's happy. your kind of guy. Get, Kicker's see, mixing to, it up a little bit. I talked to him about that yesterday after the presser. I said, Hey, if kicking doesn't work out in the NFL, it's a hard spot to get. You know, maybe talking to the coaches, getting your head in there. He's he's a physical guy coming down on coverage. You give him credit. The guy wants to be a football player yes. out there. He is. I like it very much. All right, Angelo Mangiro. He's done something pretty special in the last couple of weeks. He has played three different positions, center, right guard, and right tackle. Why? Because they needed him to, and he talked about the ability to switch positions and what's best for the team. We prepared this week like we weren't going to have those guys, and uh, you know, you just got to be ready for play because you know, there's a whole lot of fans that you know, you know don't, don't care if you're switching positions. They, they just want results. He's exactly right about that. Now, it looked like they had some moments where they looked like they were starting to get something going in the running game, but it was never consistent. Yeah, I mean, the fact is that you can see that they are getting better, but they're coming from such a low level, like to start with, that it's just frustrating. And you can just sense the frustration on his face that, that it's just been a struggle for them all year. Now, one thing that when you're the quarterback or the head coach, there's always going to be a camera that is focused on you. Christian Hackenberg, at 19 years old, Everything he does, every movement is not only seen, but it's analyzed, Andrew. 
Yeah, and I think we're overanalyzing it in the media. He's a competitor. Coach Donovan, Coach Franklin, they're competitors as well. So anytime you have a hot quarterback coming off the sidelines, maybe after a fumble, after an interception, you know, it's not necessarily that he's disrespecting the coaches. He could be upset with himself. He could be upset with maybe something that happened out on the field. And it's just overanalyzed by us that's saying, oh, well, he's disrespecting the coaches by coming off with a hot head and things like that. But, you know, sometimes it takes, you know, a phone call upstairs to maybe calm down or maybe just step away from everything, get a drink, and just calm it down. Turnovers, of course, critical. Penn State was minus two in this game, and it certainly causes frustration for the head coach. It's difficult for any team to go three yards, four yards, all the way down the field for 80 yards, um, especially when you're not running the ball consistently um, to do that. You know, and they saw early in the year we've been able to, to create some big plays and take advantage of some situations. We've also missed some opportunities as well. So, um, you know, like, I know I give you guys this answer a lot, but it's, it's not just one. It's not just one issue. It's a combination of factors. That brings us now to our Stocker Chevrolet Drive of the Week, brought to you by Stocker Chevrolet, located across from the Nittany Mall on the Benner Pike, the great, great guy, Gene Stocker. Well, here's the drive that the Nittany Lions put into the end zone. First of all, we start out with the big fumble recovery. This is the takeaway. C.J. Awanian comes up with the fumble recovery, and the Nittany Lions go to work on this drive. Christian Ackerberg, they move him out of the pocket, fires downfield. Deshaun Hamilton takes it out of bounds, and the Nittany Lions now kick it into another gear. Hackenberg again, fires this time again, goes inside of the in-cut to Hamilton for another first down as they march. He was six for six on this drive, as you can see here. This time, look at the pump fake to then get the ball to Carter. He pump fake to Lewis, then went to Carter downfield. Another first down for Penn State. Play action pass. Once again, the quick in-cut, this time to Kyle Carter again as they get the tight ends into the play. Now, this time he throws it outside. They will get the ball inside the 10-yard line to set up what will be the touchdown play here as he throws the fade to the 6'7", Jesse James. It is a drive where the tight ends caught three of those passes. That's getting the big guys that are tough matchups involved. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the fact is we've been talking about this all season long. They've got two great tight ends, in my opinion, that both will be playing on Sundays in the future. You need to get on the ball. They got on the ball. And, and to me, the frustrating part is you can see that that happens. They get them involved. And then all of a sudden, like, there, there are huge blocks of time where they're not involved at all. And I don't get it. I don't understand that. The part, though, too, is they have to be also be very solid blockers in this run game, too, and help out the offensive line. Question now is, Andrew, can they exploit the Indiana pass defense? Well, I think they, I think they can go against Indiana because I think the offensive line could hold up against that front. It's pretty much one guy that you got to block. But, Trey, like you alluded to, they have to be able to block in the scheme as well. There was a couple times sacks were given up where Penn State had eight men protection and it still broke down and Hack ended up being sacked. If you have eight guys blocking four, I mean, that cannot happen. They got to do a better job. You know, none of this like Roger Dorn and Major League Olay stuff on some of these blocks. Got to have better communication up there, and it just seems like that's off all across the front eight. Also, the other part, too, is it led to 20, uh, special teams led to 20 points in this game. Sam Ficken has been through this. He's been through the roller coaster. He's been through the life on Twitter. James Franklin says he's a resource, and Sam talked about what he has said to the punters. My career here has been a roller coaster. Um, you know, I started out really rough. Um, that's something that they obviously are relating to a little bit right now. They're not punting how they want to punt in games, um, and they're doing it in practice, and that's something that, you know, I did. Um, the exact same kind of thing. I was hitting every field goal in practice, and then it, it wasn't translating well over to games. Now, the number of people have come up to me and said, can Ficken punt? He punted all spring. He's not the answer. <laughs> and he'll tell you that he's not the answer, although he did, he did punt in high school. Coming up, we'll take a look at the defense. The numbers they put up Saturday were outstanding as we continue with Blue White Tailgate, presented by Coors Light. One hundred seventy one yards surrendered, two takeaways in the ball game, a defense that put together outstanding numbers. And by the way, Maryland was one of 14 on third down, and that was a third and one. And they didn't win the game. Yeah. I mean, that's 
That's frustration. Well, I mean, frustration is is you you can't be any more frustrated. I mean, for me, as as a former defensive player, as a Penn State player, it's really really frustrating watching this group, and I, I can only sense of, of of how difficult it is for the defense and in that locker room because they're doing everything that's expected of them, but they've lost four in a row. William Likely's punt return put Maryland at the 40-yard line, and it was a short drive. Mike Hall on that final drive. We gave them uh, too much on that first down screen. And, uh, you know, they, they basically were in field goal range right then and there. So, uh, you know, it was really one play that made or made that broke us on that last drive. I thought, um, you know, we got to play better than that whenever the game's on the line. One play. <laughs> okay. One play. That's a small margin for error. Yeah, and literally after that punt return, there was no margin for error. Craddock's long field goal of the year, 57 yards. They were at 57 yards after Likely's punt return. And Deion Barnes, I mean, I feel for the defense. After the game, he had a great game, two sacks, and he's talking about if that one play, that swing out of the backfield, if I pick up that back, they don't get down there. I mean, how can you, how can you not feel bad for a defense that's playing its heart out and then the guys are saying, you know, we, we just screwed up one play, and, and that's their margin for error at this point? Can it cause a problem in the locker room? I, I think what causes the problem in the locker room is constant media guys like myself, these guys that <laughs> probably <laughs> never Shocker. stepped on a high-level football field, basketball court ever in their life, are coming into these post games, shoving microphones in these guys' faces, and their questions are constantly, is there a fractured locker room? How do you pick up the offense? The offense just has to deal with the offensive problems. The defensive line will help the offensive line in practice. But don't constantly keep asking about it. And I asked Anthony Zettel about that, and he goes like, yeah, it's starting to get frustrating. Okay, well, the defensive line happens to be our family clothesline players of the week because they were constantly in Brown's face. I mean, he, he constantly had to run. I mean, here's Deion Barnes, two of his, one of his two sacks in the ball game. Penn State had six all together. On the attack here, Zettel forces the fumble. Alanian recovers. That set up a Penn State touchdown. Trouble again. Alanian this time converging. The defensive line was there. Austin Johnson played a really strong game. Here comes the outside. That's Garrett Sickles off the bench with his sack in the ball game as well. Ross tries to bring it to the outside. Austin Johnson says, yeah, here's the ground. Brown one more time. They are our family clothesline defensive players of the week. And Andrew Callista, he mentioned and referenced Anthony Zettel. He takes a closer look at the Nittany line defensive lineman who probably should deserve first team conference recognition. I've let, left a lot of plays out in the field that if I could have did something a little simple, uh, um, more technique wise, I could have made more of a play. So. Big play after big play this season. Four sacks, nine tackle for losses, two interceptions. It's hard to envision Zettel not being satisfied with those numbers. I think I'm relatively decent in the Big Ten, uh, but to take my game to the national level and stuff, I feel like I really have to start uh, improving. I feel like I'm doing all right, but I need to do a lot more for us to start winning. The consummate teammate, Anthony, wears his heart on his sleeve every post game, win or lose. We went through a lot of crap at Penn State, just with the sanctions and everything, and I feel like these guys on the team, I, can, I, I trust them with my life, um, and they trust me, and that's just the guys on the team. That's why I came to Penn State. I came for the players. I came for the school, too, but I came for the players, guys in the locker room. While many questions the last four weeks have been related to the offense, no defensive player has yet to take a shot at the O, and it's something that's starting to get on their nerves. It, it kind of gets frustrating a little bit, because uh, we, we have our offense back and they have our back too, so we're uh, in, in the long run, like in the grand, uh, grand scheme of everything, we're, we're one team and we either have a win or a loss, so we can't go out there and individually pick each other apart, um, so we have to stay together as a team. Guys, this kid cares so much about this team, the program in school, that after not picking up that fumble on the Deion Barnes sack because the music came on in Beaver Stadium, he said he thought the play was dead. He said it was the worst decision he's ever made in sports. Just a consummate teammate, one of the best guys in the locker room. He's an outstanding player, and you know, you played in the middle. What did the def quality defensive tackles mean for your spot? Well, I mean, it makes all the you know all the difference in the world. I mean, think about it. You know, we keep talking about who are the premier players on this Penn State football team. You know, and Mike Hull is at the front. Well, right. there would be no Mike Hull if it weren't for 
Deion Barnes and Anthony Zell and all those guys, you know, protect him up front. I mean, and, and Mike Cole would be the first one to admit that. There's no question. Now they have a, a different challenge. Indiana's a complete 180 from where they were last year. Complete 180. This is an outstanding running football team led by Tevin Coleman. So is this a case where you sell out on the run? I don't think so. I mean, the fact is that, that the defense is playing so well this year. I, I think what happens is you have a tendency to press, you know, as a defensive player if, if your offense is struggling, and you can't, you can't allow that to happen. You have to continue to stay in the game plan, do what you're supposed to be doing, and not worry about that other stuff. Well, Anthony Zettel says <laughs> it's a big thing for them to go out and sell out on the run against a team like this. Uh, yeah, every, there's a lot of the stuff that goes into it, but um, when you stop the run is the biggest key. Uh, if you stop the run, then it makes them – pass so um, I think the past teams have had difficulty stopping the run so um, that's our biggest challenge and that's what we're uh, gonna do we'll get into this a little bit later but Coleman leads the nation in yards per game he's gained 1300 he leads the nation and runs over 20 runs over 40 runs over 60 and he leads the nation and runs over 80. Yeah, and he's on pace to get close to 2,000 yards this year. And the one thing about the Penn State defense, every game they've seen to let up at least maybe a 15, 20-yard run where you don't expect it to happen. If they do that against Coleman, I mean, he's the type of back that could put six points on really quick. So, coming up, I'll sit down and talk with Tyoka Jackson about the Nittany Lions a little bit later. Mark Wogenrich will talk to Andrew about recruiting and other items as we continue on the Blue White Tailgate presented by Coors Light. Welcome back to Blue White Tailgate. Steve Jones, Trey Bauer, joined by Tyoka Jackson. Ty, welcome back. Great to have you with us. Hey, good to be here, Steve. Good to be on with you and the legend, Trey Bauer. Oh, okay. easy. Uh, easy, okay. easy. It's getting a little heavy for me in here. <laughs> Ty, we want... Is that a little too much? Uh, defensive line play, you know, between Alani and Barnes, Zettel, and, of course, Johnson. What are you seeing from Penn State's defensive line? Well, I think... It's they're starting to get better as a group. Um, you know, first it was just Zettel kind of leading the charge early on, uh, making plays in the backfield and, and getting out the quarterback. And now you're seeing the rest of the guys kind of come along. And that's what you want to see as the season progresses. You want to see improved play by everybody. And it's more than just one guy. And certainly Zettel does set the table inside. But I, I really like the way this Barnes kid is playing now. He, he's getting out to the quarterback. And I believe he's in the top five in sacks in the conference. I want to say somewhere three or four, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, I, I like his ability to get off that edge. Um, CJ certainly sets the, the edge on the run game on the other side. But uh, this kid Barnes can get after the quarterback, and, and I think that's a much-needed asset and, and dynamic for this defense because that means you don't have to blitz all the time to get pressure on the quarterback. That's a good thing. Yeah. Hey, Tyoka, what do you think, what, you know, as working for the Big Ten, so you get a chance to see a bunch of different games, and, you know, we are talking about the defensive line. Where do you rank this Penn State defensive line as far as uh, their ranking in the Big Ten? Well, I think they wanted it better, certainly. Uh, you know, when, you, when you're a top ten defense, total defense, and then you, one of the top five or six or seven against the run, that means that your defensive line is winning the battle up front. Uh, certainly from a depth perspective, we may not be as deep as some of the other teams in the conference, and we all know why. <laughs> you know, those, those sanctions have really taken its toll, and we're seeing it all over our football team at this point of the season. But in terms of those front-line guys, the four or five guys that we have uh, as a group, they're, they're one of the top D-line, uh, D-line group in, in the entire conference. And, again, the numbers bear it. And if you watch every single game, we play on the other team's line of scrimmage, and that's what it really is all about. There's a lot of defensive lines that play along the line of scrimmage and play soft, but I personally like, and winning football style like, defenses that play on the other side of the line of scrimmage. And that's exactly what we do, and we do it well. Ty, when you, for a defensive end, and nobody was really better than getting in that sprinter's stance like you would off that edge and go after a quarterback, when you face a team that has the running attack with Coleman, Roberts, and Indiana, how does a defensive end have to play that because it's not like going after the quarterback? Yeah, I mean, certainly it's a lot different. Uh, they're going to challenge you uh, by running the football. Coleman is, is an excellent back. They're going to spread you out with formations, but they want to pound you. And so as a defensive lineman, you understand going in that you have to control the running lanes. They're very, very, very one-dimensional. 
okay? Uh, in the last two games, they've thrown for 35 yards. So that tells you right there that they're not going to beat you passing the football. So winning the game is not about getting sacks this week. Sacks are fun. I love them as much as anybody that like you just talked about. But in order to win the football game, you got to take care of what the other team does best. In this case, it's Devin Coleman. So read your keys. Your keys will never lie to you, right, Trey? You yeah, read I've, your keys, and they'll take you to the football. Exactly right. I guess my question to you was that you know that it's a one-dimensional offense. I mean, would you as a defensive lineman prepare any differently for just a run-first offense versus a, you know, a balance attack? Well, certainly, what, what, I, what I'd like to do going through the week is allow the film to tell me what to do. So when you watch Indiana, again, they're going to spread you out. They're going to use different formations because if you recall last year, they were a throwing team. They like to throw it around the yard. Well, that, that's not the case anymore. Their, their starting quarterback is, is out for the season, and they're really struggling to find out who's going to be a trigger man for their team. So you watch the film. That tells you how you need to prepare. So it's all about what type of running game you expect to get from them. Will it be trash? Will it be stretch plays? Will it be quick hitting plays? What, what I know about Coleman is that he's got great vision as a running back. Uh, he's got great balance, and it's going to take a lot of players to get him down. And they're going to keep running. <laughs> they're not going to abandon the running game. There is nothing to abandon it for. So they're going to give him every opportunity to win this game for them. So what it means to me is that I'm going to have to do all I can do to hustle to the ball and get this guy on the ground for four quarters because that's really their number one uh, player on their offensive football team. So – Trey's legend to you? I just, I just want to make well, sure. Well, listen, man. I mean, I figure I'm on the radio. We're doing a pregame show. I got to get everybody excited, right? I mean, you know, but no, hey, listen, real talk, though. I, as a kid, I, there were a few names I remember as a kid, and Trey Byer was one of them. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, watching him play at Penn State was a great thrill for me. So, yes, Steve Jones, get off my back. Trey, I got your back, buddy. Thank hey, you. I appreciate hey. it. We just have to have – we have fun here, Ty, and it's always a pleasure getting your perspective on this whole thing. Thanks so much, man. It's fun for me too, guys. Let's go get a win this week. Ty Oka Jackson, and we will come back with more as the Blue White Tailgate continues, presented by Coors Light. I know you looked at that package there and said they have more than one player, right? No, he's the focal point of what goes on here. Indiana has lost three in a row, and there are certainly issues surrounding them, and the issues we'll get to a little bit later, but they all surround the quarterback spot. But Coleman, the tailback, Tevin Coleman's been outstanding. Yeah, I mean, he is the real deal. I mean, the fact is that for him to be able to put up the numbers literally with no passing game whatsoever is really a truly amazing thing. Kevin Wilson right now is uh, at Indiana as the head coach, the former offensive coordinator. We take a look at his file here as what he's done so far. And last year they, they were getting better, getting better, and then they hit this year. Look at all the offensive records. Last year they snapped off plays at a rate of 21.1 seconds of play. Now they have to change everything because they've had four injuries. They had, they had a quarterback situation year ago was great. Okay, listen to the quarterback situation. They had Cam Coffin, the JC kid. Yep. Right? He had several 300-yard passing games. They had Trey Roberson, a prime recruit. Nate Sudfeld, who performed very well against Penn State last year. Okay. Kaufman looks around at the landscape and says, um, I think I better go someplace else. Roberson, inexplicably, in July, transfers to Illinois State, where he's playing now. So Sudfeld, he's the guy. All right, fine. Except he injures his non-throwing shoulder and is now out for the year. So they bring in Covington. Tears his ACL, he's out for the year. Now they're on to Xander Diamant, a true freshman out of Los Angeles, and thus they've gone from 21.1 seconds of play to running 39 seconds of play. <laughs> Well, you got, you got to do something to keep your team in the game. And if you're going to be one-dimensional, you might want to shorten it, especially with that running game. And the injury to Suddenfeld in the Iowa game, it wasn't a hard hit that he took. It was more of the weight coming down into right. that field turf. Very freak injury for Nate and unfortunate for Indiana and their fans. They also have D'Angelo Roberts, pretty good backup guy as well, over 490 yards rushing this year and six touchdowns. As for Anthony Zettel, he knows Coleman's the kind of guy that can break tackles and make plays. I just looked at a little bit of film with the defense uh, on Sunday, so what I could see from him so far is he really explosive back, one-cut kind of guy that'll 
uh, it makes a big impact on the field when he gets the ball with eight yards of carry. So um, as a, it's a big challenge for our defense, and uh, we're excited for it. Can you dial in on one guy when you're a defense? Uh, is it possible? Well, I think what happens is that, you know, you have to think about what is the biggest threat that you have. I right. mean, it's not in Xander we trust. I mean, right. first of all, who names our kid Xander? Uh, that's another story. But but <laughs> Coleman is the real deal. The guy can run downhill. He's going to be an All-American this year. Again, he's going to be playing on Sundays, and they just need to focus on him. And, you know, Shane Wynn is a heck of a wideout, and they can't, they're trying to figure out ways to get him the ball. It hasn't been easy. Yeah, he's Mr. Do Everything. I'm still trying to get around who names their kid Xander as, 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 <laughs> as well, Trey. But Shane Wynn, I mean, Nittany Lion fans, they saw him running all over Beaver Stadium two years ago. They saw him running all over Memorial Field out there last year. Shane Wynn is a big-time player, could be playing at any one of the major college football playoff contenders right now. I mean, this kid could get open. He has speed, and he runs great crisp routes as well. Yeah, you're also the guy that's been referring to what, Todd Sadowski as Wally Pipp the entire show. <laughs> okay, uh, let's <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to the Indiana defense, and you can see graphically they have struggled so far this year. Uh, there are only 14 teams in the conference, as we pointed out, and their pass defense is dead last. Scoring defense, by the way, next to last, so is total defense as well. But it's not like they don't have guys. Bobby Richardson off the edge is really good, and Simmons is a middle linebacker. Always impresses me. Well, I mean, the fact is that they've got two big time players. They just don't have enough right. big time players. And Good the fact point. is that, you know, they got guys you'll see on NFL rosters. You look at Indiana, you go, Indiana goes, you know, four and eight and. It's like ridiculous. It's like, but the fact is they got some good players and uh, certainly two outstanding defensive players. No question. Antonio Allen probably is the best guy they have in the secondary. Guy that was really good back there last year was Greg Heben. And you looked at him, and he had an interception in last year's game, too. But they don't have that kind of guy this year. No, Allen's kind of like in that mold. He's their leading tackler on the team. That's, that's never not good. That's ne Yeah, that's <laughs> never good. And you just look at Indiana's defense. You know, they can make plays. Let's remember, this is a team that went into Columbia, Missouri, and beat the team that's leading the SEC East Division. Yes, that was with Nate Sunfield as his quarterback. But, I mean, we all know ESPN, SEC is the best conference in the world. Indiana doesn't have a win in the Big Ten, and they went into an SEC team and won. And that's a really good point, Andrew. What about the ability to exploit this pass defense? Can they do it? I think Penn State can do it. But, again, it all comes down to protection. Give Hackenberg some time. They'll be able to hit some routes. Earlier in the show, we saw Deshaun Hamilton with Hack on the rollout. Hack's got to do a better job when he's rolling out to Godwin and Blacknall, and those guys also got to run better routes because Hack's thrown a couple interceptions this year on those rollouts because the receivers have rounded off the routes with the exception of Hamilton. He's the only one that's actually cutting that straight. A little quick history thing. In 1975, Penn State had a team had an outstanding defense and also had a great kicking game and an offense that wasn't so terrific. Well, they had the place kicker that would be in the Chris Barr mold. The problem is playing the field position game, Penn State has struggled with that because of the punting problems. Yeah, I mean, the fact is that, you know, the 75 Penn State team, I'm sure Buttle was on that team. Yeah. The fact is they're playing Lehigh, they're playing Bucknell, they're, play they're not playing <laughs> Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio State, you know, Indiana. I mean, you know, give me a break. I mean, I love those guys, and Chris Barr is a good guy too. But the fact is that, you know, Penn State has to come up to the challenge every single week, and at, uh, offensively, they're just not getting it done. I'm going to have to look up that schedule. I don't <laughs> recall him playing. That may have been a shot at Buttle. Yeah, it's definitely a shot at Buttle. He deserves it. Actually, that is true. <laughs> so, <laughs> Anyone that knows Greg Buttle knows yeah, that. It's a shot it's at him, and yeah. good for him. But, I mean, the bottom line is slow down Tevin, Tevin Coleman. Actually, if you keep Coleman under 110, you've had a good day. You really have. I think yeah. that will be one of the keys. Keeping him under 110, I think, would be a good day. He's actually been over 100 in all eight games so far this year and has two 200-yard rushing days. He's had an outstanding year. Coming up, Mark Wogenrich will talk to Andrew Callista. They'll talk a little bit about recruiting and also about the Nittany Lions as we continue with the Blue White Tailgate Show presented by Coors Light. Welcome back to Blue White Tailgate. Joining us on the phone, very talented writer from the Lehigh Valley, the Penn State beat writer for the Allentown Morning Call, Mark Wogenrich. Mark, thanks for joining us. Andrew, how are you doing today? I'm doing just fine, just like at Tuesday's press conference. Everybody's fantastic. <laughs> Mark, good mood, sunshine, and everything like that, huh? That's right, and I am in Happy Valley, right? So everything's all good. <laughs> Mark, the importance for not only the team, but the fan base on getting a win this week out in Indiana. As much as James Franklin might have uh, kind of pushed past that idea, I think it, it has to be huge. Um, 
collectively, you're talking what is it, we're going on eight weeks now, seven weeks I believe it is, without a victory, obviously circumstantially with bye weeks and things like that stuck in there. But that's a long time. The way the last three games, losing three by 13 points, one in overtime, one by one point, those three games, every time there was something that could have happened, they could have swung the game in Penn State's direction. I don't even think it's just a, a psychological thing, but that's a very real, still a very real possibility to win two of three, get to six wins, get to a bowl game, and then that's December that you're working with the players again. Um, there's so many young players in this team, and for Franklin and his staff to have another three weeks with these guys working out at a, you know, before a bowl game is vital. Mark, one of the big issues right now is Christian Hackenberg's body language coming off the sidelines and Coach John Donovan. They've had a couple heated exchanges. Your take on how Coach Franklin has addressed that, and do you think it's hampering maybe the development of the offense? I'm not as concerned with body language on game day because that's just such a charged environment within the confines of the game. People are just going to be excited. They're gonna, there's going to get temp are going to flare. People are going to be heated, and there's going to be confrontation. What would be more of an issue to me is something like what James Franklin brought up yesterday, that he had a really good productive meeting with Christian Hackenberg on Monday. Monday's the team's day off, and yet he felt like it was important enough to do something like that on, on Monday to maybe air out whatever concerns he was having. You know, you, I think you want your quarterback to look a little more um, positive <laughs> really lack of a better word and in control out there but when he's just not having that success and it continues and it just compounds now i watched him a little bit on some other you know, plays and there was a couple of plays uh specifically on a couple of punts i saw him standing on the sideline and congr you know, congratulating some of the gunners coming off the field and the punt coverage team so it's not entirely negative i yeah you know, i think overall I'm not as concerned with what happens on that field as what happens in the week. And this stuff we don't get to see, but what happens in the week, you know, before and after. Mark, flashing back to 2004, do you see similarities between that defense and this defense and as well as the offense, especially going into Indiana? That's a curious thing. Somebody else had mentioned that to me. <laughs> it was, you know, the team that, that team went into Indiana with a six-game losing streak. And, I, you know, there are definitely some similarities. I think the linebackers might have been just a touch better on that team at least deeper as a unit for the future. But this group has so many guys who are, are going to return and it's just back. So this is a group that is going to imbue some younger talent next year, maybe some more speed, and have some playmakers, some guys who are making a lot of plays coming back, notably Anthony Zettel and Austin Johnson, Deion Barnes, who's just having kind of this renaissance year, the linebackers who are aside from Mike Hall who are playing exceptionally well. I remember at that game, uh, and Jay Paterno was talking about the the, uh, the goal line stand in the fourth quarter and saying that that was the kind of turning point for teams that we might not lose again until, I think what he said, we might not lose again until 2007 or something like that. And it did have a bit of a premonition to 2005 gear, although I don't know if they have that kind of swinging gate offense that's going to go for the revival of four to five. But defensively, this unit, as good as it is this year, could be, I mean, just light out exceptional next year. Mark, how do you see the game playing out on Saturday? I hate to put you on the spot, but what do you see from Indiana? 12-9. Somebody's going to win 12 now. I don't know. I, it's, um, it, it just seems like a good matchup. It's a paper-wise, it's a good matchup for Penn State because, you know, I've not seen Tevin Coleman really uh, live a lot. I just haven't seen a lot of Indiana football yet. But he's got 1,300 guns rushing. And an offense that can't, really can't throw the ball lately, having lost Nate Sudfeld, for him to be kind of the, the primary factor, you know, the only factor in their offense the last couple of weeks is, uh, is impressive. And he's somebody you've really got to keep an eye on. But it's something that Penn State handles very well. So I think being able to bottle that up and control that leans the game in Penn State's advantage. And offensively, at some point, you figure at some point something has to loosen up that the offense is going to be able to mount some sustained drives. So this is that kind of game where they, as long as they mitigate to those kind of outside forces, this really is a game they should win by a touchdown at least. Mark, thank you so much for being here. We take a quick look at the Health South 
injury update board. The usual cast of characters, Donovan Smith, Miles Diffenbach still with the question marks. We'll find out about those guys' status come Saturday. Up next on Blue White Tailgate Show, it's the good, the bad, and the ugly. And oh yeah, you know I'm dressed always pretty good. We entitled the initial part of what we affectionately call the G-Block, the good, the bad, and the ugly. When the original script came out, Andrew Callista was assigned the good. There wasn't a single person in the room that felt that fit. So you get the ugly. Yeah, I just, I just can't be the nice person. So, you know, I voluntarily took the ugly. Volunteered. And <laughs> Steve, Steve's going to take the good and talk about my shirt just because he's jealous because how good I look in it. So, but the ugly, no. Auburn versus Old Miss. The, kid, the wide receiver who broke his leg, that was one of the ugliest plays that you could possibly imagine ending maybe your college career. If you score, you're the hero, and just by a couple inches, you're the GOAT. It's just terrible for that kid to go off the field with that feeling. Would have liked to see the refs hold their decision until he was carted off. The bad. The bad, other than Callista's outfit, uh, <laughs> Randy Etzel. Okay, so you don't, you don't come in and shake the other coach's hand after the game. You don't have the kids shake the, the kids' hands, the captains. It's like, could, I mean, could it be any worse so you get fined 10 grand? Give me a break. Randy Etzel, seriously? Good is the college football playoff because here it is going into this weekend and games with a lot of meaning. That's what makes college football exciting. Games with stakes. Games with stakes. So, you know, the college football playoff with the top teams, all going head-to-head, -head, not bad. It's like a playoff weekend. So let's get to the top 25 here. Notre Dame at Arizona State. Your personal affection for Notre Dame has been evident throughout. So if you could check that love at the door and tell us who's going to win. Uh, I hate Notre Dame, as you know. <laughs> okay, I hate Notre Dame, and I'm a Catholic, so I can say that. I yeah. hate Notre Dame. Sure. And by the way, when I play, we wax them four to five years. Notre Dame is going to beat Arizona State. All right, Bama, LSU, Baton Rouge. Tiger bait all day long, roll tide, Tuscaloosa will be going nuts, you know. Oregon at Utah. Oregon's put itself in a great spot. They're, they're right now in the top four. I think it's going to be pretty close. I think um, Oregon is going to win a close one, but uh, it's going to be a really tight game, I think. Ohio State, Michigan State, the Big Ten has its game on the map. I hate the Buckeyes. Okay. I hate Ohio State. Mark D'Antonio, he's going to have his defense up there, and Connor Crook's going to have a good game. It's a lot of hate on the set. <laughs> in this. I just like to tell you. All right. Let's get to the keys of the game. What do you think? I think the keys to the game are going to be what, what's, what I've been saying all year long. Penn State has to keep, the, keep it to a small field. Um, they have to do better in the kicking game, um, and they have to be able to protect Hackenberg. And if, they, if they do not win the field position uh, battle, they're not going to win this game. And that's a huge part. I think they have to make them go a long way. If you, want to, if you want to open the door to Indiana, make it a short field, and he's absolutely right about that. I think defensively, a young kid like Marcus Allen needs to have a big game because guess what? You're going to have to have your safety make some tackles tackles against Tevin Coleman in a game like this, and Hackenberg has to have a big day. Convert your opportunities into touchdowns, don't settle for field goals, and don't shoot yourself in the foot with turnovers. But like Trey said, give Indiana that short field. How much did you miss Sadowski today? Sada where is Sadowski? I mean, Sadowski is like, I, I think the state trooper is looking for him like Freen. I mean, He's where is he? Florida. He's in Florida, He's in Florida, yeah. Florida right now. Can you believe that? Consoling Will Muschamp. Uh, you know, and he's over here, and he's, he says, you know, he kept referring to Sadowski as Wally Pip, right? And, and his he, gear, he, you know, lack thereof. Aaron's took care of the furniture on the set, and Goodwill took care of Andrew's shirt. All right. <laughs> Jealousy. Did we get Jealousy. all the sponsors here? I think we may have. All right. Noon will be the kickoff on Saturday at Memorial Stadium in Bloomington. Then we'll come back here next week and talk about the Nittany Lions and Temple. For Trey Bauer and Andrew Callista, who thinks he's Lou Gehrig, I'm Steve Jones. Thanks for joining us on the Blue White Tailgate Show presented by Coors Light.